normally hard. Okay, so let's finish the section. All right, my microphone is in the wrong place. Let's finish the section. We are doing 3.7 inverse functions. And we're finishing that off before we jump over to chapter five. So remember the things we talked about for inverse functions, right? We had some mega, mega, uh, some mega definitions that we talked about before, right? If a function is one-to-one, -one, then we know it has an inverse. That was one of the big things. And we can check whether two functions are inverses if we take their composition and we just get back x in both directions. Okay. And remember, since to find an inverse function, you essentially just switch the x's and the y's, the domain of one is the range of the other. Domain is x, range is y, so that kind of makes sense. And there is also this graphical implication of this as well. If you switch all the x's and the y's, notice that the blue graph and the green graph are essentially the same graphs. They're just reflected around this pink line. All inverse functions have that property. Okay? So you get some nice symmetry as well. So we are going to talk a little bit more about inverse functions. We only have two examples. It's going to go by fast. All right? Yeah, luckily the ocean's a big place. So we're on example seven. An example seven. <laughs> that's not the box. Find the inverse. of f of x equals 2 divided by x minus 3 plus 4. All right. So remember how to do this. We've already mentioned how to do this. We've already talked a little bit about how to do this, and we've done it for toolkit functions. Now let's do it for things a little bit more complicated than toolkit functions. All right, so to find inverses, right, we just switch the x's and the y's. So, right, this is our y's. So it's going to become x is equal to 2 divided by y minus 3 plus 4. This is how we find the inverse function. Switches your x's, switches, switch your x's, and switch your y's, and we just solve for y. This is most of the points already. Most of the hard part is remembering how to solve, oh my word, what is this? This right here is... A darn rational equation. You remember solving rational equations? We multiplied both sides of the equation by the LCD. This was 9.30, your favorite time, right? Early on in the semester when everything was beautiful, before we got into this dark and dreary land of 1400. Okay, so we multiply both sides of the equation by the LCD, y minus 3. If you wanted to move the 4 over first, you could. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to move the 4 over, actually. So you get x minus 4 equals 2 over y minus 3. And, and say you didn't like multiplying by the LCD. What it, hypothetically, if you didn't like solving those that way, you could also think about this as two ratios equal to each other. Right? x minus 4 divided by 1 is the same thing. And you could also just cross multiply if you wanted. So you get 1 times 2 is 2. This is x minus 4 times y minus 3. And you can't escape 930 because we got to foil this out. No, we can't escape 930. We don't want to foil this out. Uh, well, you have choices. You can foil it out or not. It's your choice. You have two ways of doing this. You could foil this out and solve for y. Or you could divide both sides by the x minus 4 because we want to get y by itself. So we could divide both sides by x minus 4. Let's do that, actually. All right. Well, then on this side, it cancels out. On the other side, we have 2 over x minus 4, and we're just left with y minus 3. And we've almost solved for the function. All we have to do to solve for the function is add 3 to both sides. These are the worst of these kinds of problems, these rational ones. But remember, there's... Just remember back to your 930 days on how to solve rational equations. Giving you headaches? Don't worry, we'll be moving on soon. Uh, take some Tylenol by the time it works, we'll be, we'll be on a new territory. So to answer, we just add three to both sides. 
And I'm going to write the y on the left-hand side. So we get 2 over x minus 4 plus 3. And that's our answer. If you want to be a superstar, you get f inverse of x is 2 over x minus 4 plus 3. This right here is the happy face answer. This right here is the OK answer. And remember, let's, let's tie it all in. Let's tie it all together like a birthday gift with a bow on top. We already put the wrapping paper on it. What was our original function? Our original function, we said, this is a reciprocal function, shifted right three units and up four with a vertical stretching of two. Oh. Right? It's right three because it's a minus three on the inside of that reciprocal. It's up four because it's a plus four at the end. And it's getting multiplied by two. Two over one, so that's why there's a two up top. So vertical stretching by two. All right. <laughs> yeah, it looks pretty similar, huh? This one is right four and up three. Okay. And reciprocal functions are kind of hard to solve. We also change the signs of them, too. Well, I, I, I guess if you want to think of the minus sign, it's just staying there. Yeah, I didn't notice that, Delaney. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Do all that work and you get something that doesn't look that much different. All right. And that's what we're doing here. So let's do another one. Okay. Part B. F of X equals 2 plus the square root of X minus 4. This one will look a little bit more different. Although the 2 and the 4 will still come into play. So we switch the X's and the Y's. So this becomes X. This becomes 2 plus the square root of y, y minus 4 is how we find the inverse function. What does the 2 mean? So for, for purposes of this section, the 2 doesn't matter. For purposes of, uh, of function transformations, the 2 means a vertical stretching. Because essentially what we have is like a reciprocal function looks like this. Vertical stretching is multiplied by 2 on the outside, which does just is also the same as 2 over x. Is that your question, Bella? <clears throat> okay, so going over here, we now have to solve this equation and oh my goodness, in part A, it was a rational equation. We had to remember how to solve rational equations, which we did in 9.30. Here, this is a radical equation and we also solved radical equations in 9.30. How exciting. Um... So, what do we got here? We have to solve this equation. Remember, when we solved radical equations in 930, when we solve these in 930, we said isolate the radical and then square both sides. So, to get the radical by itself, we have to move that 2 over. So, subtract 2 from both sides. That gives us x minus 2 equals the square root of y. Minus 4. Good, the radical's all by itself. Uh huh. So. And yeah, still, uh, we'll, we'll work something out. Just let me know and we'll figure it out. You don't have to worry too, hopefully, not stress too bad about your Wi Fi. So what we have right here, what do we do next? We square both sides. But remember when we square both sides, there is some trick, a pothole, a, a sinkhole, some quicksand that you have to be careful not to fall into. All right? when we square this side, that's fine. When we square this side, we have a binomial being squared on this side. We have to foil that left-hand side out. Okay, so the right-hand side is easy. That's just y minus 4. Squared and square root, they cancel each other out. But the left-hand side does need to be foiled. All right. 
And, and you could foil it. And, and normally you probably would foil it. But since we're talking about quadratic functions today, I'm actually going to leave it B for now. I'll take both. All right, you could foil. Because this is a really interesting tie-in for what we're going to talk about later on today. Add 4 to both sides. What do you get? You get y equals x minus 2 squared plus 4. Or again, if you really want to be a mathematical superstar, f inverse of x is x minus 2 squared plus 4. Because this is what we're going to talk about later today. And we're going to call this standard form of a parabola. And it's a really nice form of the parabola. Okay. Yeah, if you're having internet issues, just let me know. And you can watch the video afterwards if, if it's really causing some problems and making it unwatchable. All right. So then what we have right here. Notice, what did we start with? We started with a square root function that was getting shifted up two units and right four units. And we ended with a parabola that got shifted up four units and right two units. So there's always that relationship between functions and their inverses. The function transformations get kind of flipped in a way. All right. But to solve it, just switch the x's and the y's, and then it, as soon as we do this one step, this one magic clickbait step that will solve all your problems, it becomes, hey, how well do you remember 930? And this is why you guys, as a class, have a little bit of an advantage over a lot of other 1400 classes. It's because you have done this pretty recently. So a lot of you, if you don't have mastery over it, at least at one point you've showed me that you could do it. So you can do it again. All right. So you have that little, you have that little advantage at least. All right. And that's example seven. If there are questions, go ahead and ask them. Otherwise, we're going to go to example eight. You remember factoring? That's great. We're going to be doing more factoring later, too. And earlier, we've done some factoring. We're going to do some more. Factoring is like the gift in mathematics. It just keeps on giving or taking. I don't know. <laughs> All right, example eight. Below. This class is also so sneaky. So many of these examples are just like little teasers of what's to come. All right. Below is F. Graph F inverse of X. If it exists, if it doesn't, you just say it doesn't exist. If it exists on the same axes. Okay. So, here's a graph that's going to be given to you. Uh, let's say this graph has the points, say, 1, 0, 2, 1, 4, 2. Let's say asymptotes at the y-axis then grows from there. So you might say, wait, Jason, I don't know what F is. How the heck am I supposed to graph what F inverse is? And the answer is to look at the points, right? This is the point 1, 0. This is the point 2, 1. This is the point 4, 2. To find the inverse function, one of the big things that we've been saying in this section is that you switch the x's and the y's. Well, that works for graphs too, right? If we switch the x's and the y's, right? What happens? 1, 0 becomes 0, 1. So I don't get to use this red pen for grading anymore, but I can use it for graphing. So we get 0, 1 as a point on F inverse. Well, it's another point. We got 2, 1 right there. That's going to become 1, 2. Ah. 
And then we got four comma two. We know what that's going to become. That's going to become two comma four. So we have some points. There's one other thing we can utilize, right? The black function has an asymptote on the y-axis, right? Let's write that down, actually. All right, asymptote is y-axis. Remember, asymptote is just something, it's just a line that the function gets close to but never crosses. But for the inverse function, switch the y's and the x's. So notice everything, if we just switch the y's and the x's, we get all the information we could possibly desire. Everything in your wildest dreams will come true if you switch the x's and the y's. And we get information about the inverse function. So it's going to get really close to the x-axis, but never hit it. And notice again, we have that symmetry. Every single function and its inverse should be symmetric about that diagonal line. So see that beautiful symmetry that we have. And this is the little teaser, the teaser of a teaser of chapter six, because this red function is an exponential function. This black function is a logarithmic function. And we're going to be spending a lot of chapter six talking about those kinds of functions. But chapter five comes first. But that's it for chapter three. I've said a lot of chapter names. That's all there is to know about inverse functions. You can do it all, and you will do most of it on your quiz tomorrow. All right? If there are any questions, now's a good time to ask them. Otherwise, we're going to move on to the next section, which is going to be chapter five. Chapter five, we don't spend too long talking about. But it's going to be polynomials. And we're going to start with 5.1, quadratic functions. Quadratics are just second order polynomials, polynomials with degree two. It just means there's x's and the exponents don't get any bigger than two for quadratics. All right. And that's what we're going to be talking about for the rest of today. So we're going to start with some definitions and then we're going to ease into the section. There's some neat things that happen here, graphically, as well as ungraphically. Okay, and that's not really some words, or that's not really words, but I can't talk today. Some terms. Let's start by talking about. They're not real. I'm not really going to define all this stuff. We could have paragraphs of definitions, but as long as you have a picture to kind of associate different things, that should be sufficient. So, say we have some parabola and. Let's say the parabola looks like this. Let's say hypothetically that you can also see the parabola on the screen, hypothetically. All right. There are some few things about this that we have to know. So we already talked about what these are called. Right, these two points are the x-intercepts, the zeros, um, there are other terms for these as well, All right? This is x-intercept, also known as the zeros. They have a couple different names. And we know how to find those. We just set the equation equal to zero, and we can solve that with factoring, completing the square, the quadratic formula, the square root property, 930 abounds. Wow, what a coincidence that 1400 uses so much math, 930. Not a coincidence. Okay, so that's one thing that we're going to be talking about. Another thing, and this relates to your quiz yesterday as well. Remember when we talked about even and odd functions? Right, even functions were symmetric about the y-axis. So this is not symmetric about the y-axis, right? It's not the same to the left of this as it is to the right. Now there is some symmetry, but not about this. Okay, so... What do we actually have? Look at this dashed line. This quadratic is symmetric about this line. So what do we call this? We call this the axis of symmetry. So it's not, this, this is not an even function right here, but it does have symmetry, just not the right kind of symmetry for it to be even. 
okay? It's the same to the right of the dashed line as to the left. A reflection. Something else that we talk about is the very bottom or the very top of a parabola, which, not so coincidentally, lies on the axis of symmetry. It's called the vertex. All right, and the final thing that we talk about that you already know about, this is the y-intercept, where it intercepts the y-axis. Um, also, I'm never going to write axis of symmetry again. A lot of times I will abbreviate that AOS or usually with the capital letters AOS like that. Axis of symmetry takes too long to write. I don't, have, I don't have the patience for that. So these are essentially all the things that we're going to talk about today. We're going to figure out how to find them all. We're going to figure out how to talk about them all, what they all mean, application problems starting tomorrow. There's some good application problems with this stuff. So I hope you're pumped up for that. But today is going to be a lighter, lighter situation. Okay. All right. So what do we have here? We have example one. It's going to be a nice introductory example. No, no, it should be light, Kinley. If it's not light, if it's not light, you let me know, okay? If this is, if this is not light, I'll be the first. I don't know how to finish that sentence. I don't know how to finish that sentence. All right. Well, we can have a poll. All right, consider the parabola given oh i should have done this on the next page we're going to have to be flipping on the next page all right i don't have to flip my page to show you guys so consider this parabola uh, and uh oh. it'll look something like this um, let's have a standard parabola shifted right two units and down no yeah right two units and down one okay so standard parabola shifted right two units and down one Then it goes up one over one, down over two, up four. So that brings it up to three. And just kind of zooms on up like this. Let's talk about this parabola. Now let's talk about a couple things about it. Part A. Find the. <laughs> this is funny. So I, I, like to, I like to model my lectures after the book so that when you do the homework problems that they're very similar because then, you know, the whole point of the lecture is to teach you things and the homework should be somewhat similar so that you can cement that understanding. But this is funny because in part A, there are multiple parts to part A. And I figure if you're already having a part A, why don't you just have the parts and parts? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Anyway, find the vertex. the axis of symmetry, the zeros, and the y-intercept. So find just everything that we talked about in that little picture we drew. So we're going to need to remember the picture, of course, so that we can find this stuff. So let's look at it. Yeah, y, sorry, y-intercept is pointing to this one, by the way. X-intercept is the zeros, okay, vertex is the bottom, Y-intercept is where it intersects the Y-axis, axis of symmetry is the thing that it's reflexive around, okay. So let's just do one at a time, vertex. Someone tell me the vertex of this in the chat. What else do we need? Zeros. And using our definition, vertex is the bottom, which is two, negative one. Exactly. Thank you. 
So vertex is just a point to negative one. It's either the bottom or the top of the parabola. So the axis of symmetry is where it's symmetric. And it's always going to be the vertex. It's always going to relate to the vertex, right? This is a point. This is a line. So we need to find the equation of this vertical line, because this vertical line that I just drew is the axis of symmetry. I'm going to be a bit of a stickler on this, because you might just say, oh, that's 2. But it's an equation of a line, so you need to give me the equation of the line. And the equation of the line is x equals 2. Right, equation of a line is what your axis of symmetry is. I will take off points if you don't give me an actual equation for this. Okay. And then again, the zeros. The zeros are just the x-intercepts. Zeros are when the function value, and function value is the y, function value is zero. So the x-intercepts we just see right here, those are the points, the places where x is one and where x is three. Okay. And the y-intercept is just where it intersects the y-axis, and <laughs> you can see my graph is really not, um, really not perfect. But it goes through that point, 0, 3. The y-intercept is when y equals 3. Right, and that's our answer. So just looking at a graph and saying, do I know what the vertex is? What does axis of symmetry mean? What do the zeros mean? What does the y-intercept mean? And just taking that information from the graph. So light not light. Pretty light so far, right? Again, by the end of the section, it's going to be hard. But I think we start off not too bad. I, I have been wrong on occasion, though, once or twice. Part B. What is the equation of the parabola, find the equation. <gasps> this is like function. That's not how you spell. That's not how you spell parabola. <laughs> there, that's not it. Parabola, totally fixed. All right. So the y-intercept is just where it intersects the y-axis. So this is the y-axis right here. So it intersects it right here, just like the x-intercept is where it intersects the x-axis, which is these two places. Okay. So. We're going to go back to function transformations right here. Ooh, function transformations. Because a parabola is our, one of our toolkit functions, right? So what happened to this toolkit function? Right? This is just x squared is a toolkit function. But then we go right two units and down one. Aha! It all ties together, all right? And all this math tying together is a good thing and a bad thing. Because it's a good thing, because if you remember 3.7, it's going to make the future, sorry, 3.5, the future things easier. And if you don't, well, then that's the bad case, which is not good. So you get x minus 2 squared minus 1. Yeah, exactly. Good, good, good. So our function is going to be f of x. Write 2 means subtracting 2 from the inside of the function. Down 1 means subtracting 1 on the outside of the function. Good. And again, this is what we are going to be calling standard form or vertex form. And the reason why we're eventually... We haven't introduced this yet. I'm kind of jumping, jumping the gun. One of the reasons why is because, look, it has the vertex right there. The vertex was 2, negative 1, so you can easily, not easily, but you can find the vertex quite quickly from this form as opposed to um, general form, which we'll talk about later. And by later, I mean right after this. Uh, this will not be on the quiz tomorrow. Your quiz tomorrow will only cover, will only cover 3.7 inverse functions. All right, and I'm trying to be good with this. So like on Canvas, uh, if you open up Canvas, what you should see is that your quiz tomorrow will specify what it's on. 
and the quiz should always cover exactly the same thing as the homework that's due that day. 5.1 won't be due until next Tuesday. So your next Tuesday quiz will probably be on 5.1 and 5.2. But you can always ask for clarification because, you know, again, I do make mistakes sometimes. So feel free to, feel free to always ask. Uh, but my goal is to keep this always updated for you so you always know what your quiz is on. That's a goal. But, you know, don't always achieve my goals. So here we go. Let's go on to example, not an example just yet. Okay. Here we go. What are the zeros? This is a clever, a little, this is some, some, some magic is about to happen. I hope you are ready for some magic. What are the zeros of this quadratic function? Y equals AX squared plus BX plus C. Remember that zeros are just the x-intercepts. And x-intercepts, just like we did in 2.1, x-intercepts are just the points where y is zero. So it's the points where this is true. So see what's going on here. What are the points where this is true? We have to solve this equation. We can solve this equation with the quadratic formula, right? The zeros are x equals negative b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4 times ac all over 2 a. And notice something really interesting. Okay. Oh, by the way, I was supposed to introduce this as a definition. This is called general form. AX squared plus BX plus C, as opposed to vertex form, which we're going to talk about later. Notice, if we know what the, vert if we know what the X intercepts are, we know where the vertex is. The vertex is always smack dab between the X intercepts. The axis of symmetry is always smack dab between the zeros. So what is the point in the middle of these two points? What is the axis of symmetry? You might even say... You might even say that the axis of symmetry is the midpoint between the zeros, right? This axis is just smack dab between these x-intercepts. So we just could find, if we found the midpoint of these two locations, we could get a formula for where the axis of symmetry always is, which could be nice. Well, notice what are these two points? One point is negative b plus this over 2a. The other point's negative b minus this over 2a. So the thing right in the middle, it's just a thing without the plus or minus. Oh. Right, it's in the middle of the zeros. And what's in the middle of the zeros? x is equal to just negative b over 2a. This is useful. All right, and I said this section starts off pretty easy. This is, this is sort of deriving a formula. So deriving a formula is never really that easy. So yeah, if this doesn't make too much sense, that's okay. But it's, if you'd forget to memorize this, and you can remember where it comes from. You'll save yourself a lot of trouble. The axis of symmetry. Look at it graphically, right? Axis of symmetry is always between the zeros. <laughs> so, horror. <laughs> so, again, you, it's just going to be, it's like the quadratic formula, just without the square root part. 
is what's in the middle of these. If you wanted to use the midpoint formula to find the average here, you could. But that'd be a, it'd be a little messy. You guys don't want that. We could also, in addition to those, we can have a, a happy person standing next to a happy sun. Maybe with some flowers. And the flowers are also happy, but you can't see that level of detail. They have little leaf hands. The flower is almost the size of that person, but there are some big sunflowers out there, so I don't, I don't think that's too unrealistic. So we're gonna use this formula for the axis of symmetry. All right, so let's get into a definition of vertex form and uh, talk about this formula a little bit more. All right, yeah, I love Undertale. That, I need to play that game again. I, I've played Undertale like every single way it's possible to play it. I wanna do another genocide run though. Although, see, I like the genocide run in Undertale where you kill everyone because it's really hard and I like that. But it kind of makes me feel like a bad person. Let's do example, no, not example two yet. Slow down. Getting distracted. Thinking about evil flowers trying to kill me. Definition. The vertex form, otherwise known as standard form. <laughs> the vertex form, or I say kill everyone, because that's what you do in the, yeah, whatever, never mind. Of a quadratic function. Is f of x equals a times x minus h squared plus k, and that has vertex h comma k. Note also that h is equal to negative b over 2a from general form. So there's a lot to unpack here. It's like moving across the country when you're a really rich person and you have way more stuff than you could possibly need. They have a lot of unpacking to do. Although if they are really that rich, they probably have people to unpack for them. Who knows? Maybe they're, maybe this metaphor doesn't really matter that much, but there's a lot going on here. So vertex form, We've, we've already seen stuff like this. This is the form that's really nice for function transformations, right? Because this is just, if we talk about function transformations, this is a quadratic equation shifted right h units and up k units. Oh, that's why that's the vertex, hk. It also has a vertical stretch of a. All right, so everything's tying together. This whole class is just a bunch of threads in a beautiful knot. Not those knots that you can't untie, those knots that you tie and are secure, and then you can untie them quickly if you need to. All right, so here we go. Let's use this. Let's start getting our hands dirty, but in a clean way, because we're wearing gloves. Let's get our gloves dirty, okay? Let's do two more examples, I think, and I think we'll call it for today and answer homework questions if people have them. Um, let's do attendance right now, too. Uh, for attendance today, attendance today, give me your least favorite section of this class. Or if you don't want to choose your least favorite section, just give me some section of this class. That's what we'll do for the attendance question today. And I, I understand that some people probably don't have a least favorite section some people would say i love this whole class you can tell me that too <laughs> and then i'll know who the liars are among you but that's what we'll do for the extra credit question today All right, let's get going. Example two, finally. 
<laughs> the actual example too. Yeah, I forgot to hand out life jackets before this class started. No, Math 930 is your life jacket. Maybe it's not helping. <clears throat> Write an equation for G in standard form or vertex form. Then expand it to write it in general form. So it's easy to get, excuse me, it's easy to get these definitions mixed up. Okay? So if you get these definitions confused, I'm okay at answering them. Vertex and standard are the same. That's this factored form. General form is the ax squared plus bx plus c. Okay. And yeah, technically there's two examples left, but one of them has two parts. So it's kind of like there are three problems left. All right. So I'm going to give you a graph. You're going to turn it into an equation, and then you're going to use that equation to turn it into another equation. Wow. <laughs> it's a problem that keeps on giving. All right. So what we have right here is going to be... One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And it's going to start at negative two, negative three. X is negative two, Y is negative three. That's where the vertex is going to be. And then if we go over two, we go up one. Over two, we go up one. If we go over four, we go up four. We go over four, we go up four. So, oh, look how wide this guy is. This parabola is nice and wide. All right. So let's see what we have right here. We need to identify what function transformations were done to this. So, we start with the vertex. Vertex is good for finding your shifts. All right, function transformations says we're going left two and down three, because the vertex is at the point negative two, negative three. All right. And then what else happened? This thing got horizontally stretched. You could also think about it as vertically compressed. But notice, usually in a parabola, we go over one and up one. But here we went over two before we went up one. Usually if we go over two, we go up four. But here we had to go four over. We had to go twice as far in terms of x. This is a horizontal stretch by two. And remember, horizontal stretches are kind of backwards from what you might think. This was on your quiz on yesterday. So we have to include all of this all together. So we get f of x is equal to, there's no vertical stretch, which is going to be something squared and then down three. All right. We said it's left two, so it's going to be a plus two. And we said a horizontal stretch by two. Horizontal works kind of the backwards of what you might think. So it's going to be a one half x on the inside. This is not right. This is actually not right. Crap. Um, I actually gave you the wrong graph, and I tried to save it, but it didn't work. I apologize for that. 
Let's do something very similar. I do apologize. I should have just fixed it when I noticed it. So slightly different graph, but very similar. Left two, down three, but no horizontal stretching. Okay. So it's going to be the same function transformations just without the horizontal stretching. All right. So what do we have? We have left two down three. That's going to be the function x plus two squared minus three. Okay. So that's the equation in vertex form or standard form because you can easily get using the definition of vertex form that the vertex is h comma k with a minus sign right there in front of the h. The vertex is negative 2, negative 3, exactly what we thought. All right. Then what happens is we need to expand it now to write it in general form, right? Recall, remember general form, right? That's ax squared plus bx plus c. So we have to expand this. So we just FOIL this out. So if you FOIL this out, what do you get? You get x squared plus 4x plus 4. And then you still have that minus 3 from before. And then just collect the like terms. x squared plus 4x plus 1. This is our answer in general form. Technically, the answer is the whole thing. Okay. That's how you do these sort of problems. Look at the graph, find the vertex, look at the function transformations, write an equation using toolkit functions, expand it out, and then collect like terms and simplify. All right. And remember what we did previously, right? This, so that's the end of the problem, right? End of the problem is right there. Remember, we said the vertex is x equals negative b over 2a. Let's check our answer. Is our vertex actually negative b over 2a? b is 4, so we get negative 4 over 2 times a, which is 1. This should be our vertex. And if we do that, we get negative 4 over 2, which is negative 2. Is x equals negative 2 our vertex? Yes, it is. Okay, so it's just one way to kind of see how everything ties together. That actually was our, sorry, not vertex, axis of symmetry. Goodness, I am so scatterbrained today. The vertex can be found with this x component, but then you also need to find the y component, which again, we already know the vertex is negative 2, negative 3. All right, so let's move on to the last problem with part A and B, of course. And then we will be done a little early today, maybe, probably. Example three. Find the vertex and write in standard, AKA vertex, Form part a f of x equals 2x squared minus 6x plus 7. So say you don't like formulas. Let's say you don't, you don't want to use that the axis of symmetry is negative b over 2a, hypothetically. Did you know there's another way of doing this? You could complete the square. Oh, wouldn't that be fun? All right, I'll, I'll show how, how completing the square works on part B. But we're just going to use the vertex formula right here for part A. So remember, the vertex is HK. Right? Recall the, that H right, is the same X. as the axis of symmetry. 
So we, let's find h first. h is going to be negative b over 2a. What is negative b? Negative b is positive 6. 2a is 4, because a is 2. So h is just going to be 3 halves. Right? And then k is just the resulting y value. So if we find the x value, the x value is k, sorry, the x value is h, k is just the resulting y value. So we just plug it into the function, right? So k is going to be f of h. So if we find f of 3 halves, we'll get our k value. So it's going to be 2 times 3 halves squared minus 6 times 3 halves plus 7. If you type that into your calculator, you should get something. Um, 2 times 3 halves squared minus 6 times 3 halves plus 7. You're going to get 5 halves. So we found h, we found k. Vertex form, if you remember it, is f of x is equal to a times x minus h squared plus k. So x is the variable. h, we found that, that's 3 halves. k, we found that, that's 5 halves. a, we didn't find a. Or did we? Right? Remember, general form is ax squared plus bx plus c. This is a right here. Right? We used a already for the vert to find h. So a we said was 2. h we said was 3 halves. And k we said was 5 halves. And we got our answer in vertex form. That's how you approach these. That's one way to approach it. You could also complete the square. So I'll show you what I mean by that. If you want to do it this way, do it that way. But if, if you say, Jason, I love completing the square, then part B is the method for you. Okay? Part B is going to be g of x. These will have 13 plus x squared minus 6x. Regardless of which method you're doing, though, you should look at this and say, mm, this is not good. I don't want to do it this way. Look, why is there an x squared in the middle? x squared should be in front. Let's get things in the right order, shall we? Well, let's order it up, right? x squared minus 6x plus 13. Now it's in general form. Okay, so you can also, right, could, again, do the fact that h is going to be negative b over 2a, and k is just going to be f of h. Or, you could complete the square, and it is up to you which method you want to use. I just want to show you one of each so you can say, mm, I like that one better or mm, I like that one better. You get the freedom. Math is like math is like a mountain. There's so many different ways you can go down it. You could hike this way. You could hike that way. You could do switchbacks. You could roll down. <laughs> there are some unsafe ways to go down mountains, too, just like math. All right. So how do we complete the square? Remember, to complete the square, we need to add negative b over 2a squared. Wait, that's not true. <laughs> add whew, b over 2 squared to complete the square. There's too many letters and numbers in this class. Although I'm sure you guys know what that feels like. 
But normally we would add it to both sides. But we don't have a second side. This is just a function. So instead, we're going to add and subtract. OK. So our b is negative 6. What's half of that? Negative 3. And when you square that, you get positive 9. So we're going to add a positive 9 and subtract a positive 9. And we'll see what happens. How, how do we, how, what does completing the square even look like here? You're going to find out. So we have x squared minus 6x. We want a perfect square, so we're going to add the 9 right here. But we can't just make the function whatever the heck we want. If we're adding it, we must keep balance, subtract it as well, and we still have that plus 13. Right. So notice, right, we aren't changing anything. We're just rewriting it. Because plus 9 minus 9 is 0. These cancel out. And we still have the exact same g of x as before, right? x squared minus 6x plus 13. That's exactly what we had. But we could certainly write it this way if we wanted. Now, we factor these first three terms. Perfect square. How does it factor? Well, it becomes x minus 3 squared. Remember, every time you complete the square, it's always going to be that b over 2 that's on the inside. Negative 3, negative 3. And then all that's left over, right, if we factor the first three terms, all that's left over is these last two terms. Negative 9 plus 13 is plus 4. Wait a minute. This is in vertex form. We completed the problem. It snuck up on us. So there's only one step. If you complete the square, you just complete square and you do it. If you use the formulas, it's two steps. Find h, find k, and then plug them in. So this is vertex form right here. So you have multiple ways of doing it. All right. What I like to do is I like to complete the square if there's no coefficient right here. If there's a coefficient here, completing the square gets a little nastier. All right. So th this is the, the simpler half of the section. <laughs> Tomorrow we're going to do the more complicated one. So the plus 9 right here is part of the factoring. This, these three terms right here perfectly factor into the x minus 3. And then these remaining two terms became the plus 4. I tried to group way too many things at once. Try to show that these became zero. These three become that. And these two become the four. Uh -huh. Good question, Lane. Thank you. Good. Tomorrow's going to be a spicy section. Look at what we got tomorrow coming. So after this, we got some applications about a farmer and a newspaper. This newspaper one's really good. And then we, uh, then we got some easier stuff after that. Okay. Gabe, if you need some extra help, I can, I can work with you. Yeah, just send me questions. Send me questions. Talk about things you don't understand, and we'll figure it out. All right. Wait, where did Stardew Valley come from? I'm going to start talking about Stardew Valley now after Undertale. We don't want that. I'll talk about Stardew Valley for like 500 hours. Oh, the farmer. I got it. Yeah, that's a good game. I'm glad you have good taste in games, Kindling. All right, so that's it for today. We finished a little early. I'll stay late, though. If you want to ask any homework questions, in the next 15 minutes of class, go ahead and ask now. All right. 
Yeah, I think it's even a lot more fun. On, I, I love the multiplayer in Stardew Valley. If you find a good person to play with. So good. All right, any homework questions that people want me to go over? Yeah, if you don't want to ask any homework questions, Bella, you don't have to. Uh huh. If you just want to say that was a great lecture, I'm going to go home. You're probably already home. I'm going to go to the living room, sit on the couch, look at the beautiful snowy rain, whatever that thing is outside, and uh, contemplate the beauty of mathematics. Go for it. Erica's asking about number 17 on the homework. Let's talk about that. Okay. So, what does that look like? All right, see you, Kinley, Lexi. Uh, this is 3.7, number 17. Use function composition to verify that they're inverse functions. Okay, so what we do for those ones is you just take f of g and g of f and hope that they cancel each other out and you're just left with an x. Because if we look at our definition, for inverses, this is the place we want to look at. If it's an inverse function, the function composition in both directions should just simplify down to x. Okay, so let's look at this and, and, and see it. I'll show it one way and then you, could, you can mimic it to show it the other way. All right, 3.7, number 17. f of x is the cubed root of x minus 1, and g of x is equal to x cubed plus one. So we need to show, my n's always look like w's, right? that f composed with g of x is just equal to x and that g composed with f of x is also equal to x. That's what the problem is asking. So you just, Try to find it out. F composed with g of x is f of g of x. Start on your inside and work your way out. g of x is x cubed plus 1, so we replace the g with the x cubed plus 1. All right. So, then what we get is that this plugs in to f. And yeah, this textbook is free for anyone. Anyone can find it. It's just uh, Google OpenStax College Algebra is what this textbook is. So we plug this into f. f is the cubed root of something minus 1. But that's f of x. The something here is x cubed plus 1. So when we plug g into f, the whole inside gets going there. All right, and we just simplify and hope it equals x. Get the cubed root. This becomes x cubed well, plus 1 minus 1. Those cancel. And then we're left with a cubed root of x cubed. And this is where you have to be careful and going, try to back, remember back to 930. If, it's an, if these are even, then it's the absolute value of x. But since they're odd, it's just an x. Okay. The square is where you get confused. Okay. But you're good on the function composition then, it sounds like, which is nice. And then when you do it the other direction, the other direction should actually be a little easier. Since, since you're not actually confused, uh, since your question was not actually the composition, it was more of the numbers, let me really quickly show you the other direction. g of f of x, right, again, f is the inside function here, that's the cubed root of x minus 1. We plug that into g, we get g is something cubed plus 1, that's g of x. And the something in this case is that cubed root of x minus 1, 
these cancel. The cubed on the outside and the cubed root, these are inverse functions and they cancel. We're just left with the x minus one and then the plus one from before, which also again works out. I don't know why I boxed this. Does that help at all or if you have follow-up questions? If anyone else has any questions about anything, now's a good time to ask as well. Because there's still technically some time left in class. So if it were square, different, it, it works differently evens and odds, right? If we had something like this, square root of x squared, this also cancels. But if you remember back to 930, this is actually the absolute value over here. So with even exponents, you can sometimes, sometimes get into some pickles. because it's even. And the index is actually more important. The fact that this is like the square root, there's like a hidden two right there. Good. Anything else? Exactly, Erica. Yep. Mm hmm. Good. My cat can hear me put my pen on the desk, and she gets super excited. She always wants to play with it. It woke her up. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, we I'm going to head out. Grade some, well, not your quizzes, grade another class's quizzes. That's always fun. Anyway, have a good day. Oh, number 29? Yeah, 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 good. Um, so 29, use a graph of the 1, 1 function. Sketch a graph of f inverse. So yeah, that this is exactly the same, not exactly, but this is very similar to... Um, to what we did at the end of today. Um, no, I don't understand what you mean about 210. What we have right here is like, um, you just switch all the X's and the Y's. If you didn't want to graph it, wait, but you have to graph it? I don't think I understand your question. Because the, the problem is asking you to graph it. You just look at this and you switch all the x values and the y values. So there, on this graph, there's the point 2 comma 0. 
So over here, we'll write the point 0, 0,2. We could write the domain and range in interval notation, but we could not write the function in intervals. The function cannot be written in, in intervals. I'm again, I'm, I'm I don't think I'm completely following you. So it also has the point six comma two. So you'd plot the point two comma six, and that's how you'd graph it. Okay, it sounds like it did. I somehow managed to answer it, which is good. Thank you. But other questions before I go? If there are any questions, please ask them. I would love to answer some more. Okay. Well, thank you for asking, Erica. Have a good day. If anyone has further questions or they come up later in the day, feel free to message me on Discord. Goodbye.